Mark is going to do a talk now. I don't know whether anyone has seen it on Stardock, but Mark has been burrowing his way through the Elite Source and has annotated it in exquisite detail. So I believe he is going to give us a talk all about that. I am, Thank yes. You, Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so this talk is about Elite. Um, I, I probably don't need to introduce Elites to anybody, space game from 1984, Acorn Soft released, uh, written by Ian Bell, David Braben. Um, I should, uh, before going into this, say I'm a big fanboy. <laughs> and uh, back in the uh, early 80s, in 1984, when it came out, I was 14, which was the perfect age to be completely captivated by it. Um, I played it far too much, uh, got to Elite in the tape version, and then got to Elite all over again in the disc version. So um, I fell in love with it and spent far too long playing the game. Um, fast forward to now, and um, I'm a programmer uh, for my uh, career. And um, basically this, this is a, a kind of project from lockdown 1.0 at uh, the beginning of the year. Um, and uh, like, like a lot of people, um, I probably bumped into the source code uh, for Elite that Ian Bell released on his uh, website some time ago. And I remember eagerly grabbing it, unzipping it, loading it into an editor and seeing this kind of thing and thinking, I have absolutely no idea what is going on at all because the original sources were built on a BBC Micro. Um, <clears throat> so they're about, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. There's sort of seven main basic programs that generate the source code and uh, the main game code rather and they are incredibly terse there's hardly any comments there's no spaces it's it's really difficult to get your head around so i kind of gave up pretty quickly after downloading that i'm sure a lot of people would have had a, a vaguely similar experience but I, I always wanted to understand how it worked you know having having gone into programming you look back and you think that was an astonishing achievement i mean everybody knew it at the time and it always amazed me. I, I've always wanted to know how it worked. So um, a little bit later, I was, I was really pleased to bump into um, an, an annotated uh, disassembly of the disc version of the leak that Paul Brink put together, which again was on Ian Bell's site. And um, it, well, it was sort of an improvement, but I still, I mean, I sat down with a cup of tea and tried to work out what was going on and still had no idea. Now, th this bit on the screen here is probably one of the most um, documented parts of that source code and <laughs> it's it's quite confusing it's a bit like a sort of cryptic crossword really trying to work out what this is uh, you know there is still these strange xx16 and stuff going on there and there's some stuff about rot mats and inwk and and I, to be honest I started poking through that and thought I still don't have a clue what's going on um, so I put that to one side and thought well Oh, well, never mind. I guess I'm never really going to understand how this thing works. Um, until um, lockdown, at the beginning of this year, when I was stumbling through the web looking for stuff to do, and I came across a Stardot post uh, by Kieran Connell, who's uh, in the BitShifters Collective, who do those amazing things, amazing demos we've all seen and had him talk and really impressive stuff. And he'd, he'd taken this uh, source code from the original basic files and created a bbasm version so you can assemble it on a modern computer produce uh, an ssd disk image and fire that up in your uh, um, emulator or on your bbc and it looks a bit like this so it's exactly the same it's just nicely laid out but the key thing is that it could, you could build with it and if you can build the working product with something then as a programmer you can get stuck into it more easily in a modern environment with all the text editors and, and stuff like that so this really was, um, this, I, I thought, wow, I can do something with this. Surely I can use this to work out some of the bits of Elite that had always interested me. Um, so I grabbed it and just started kind of poking around with it and changing things and seeing what it did. Um, there's various bits of information out there on the web and, and uh, pulled it together 
and uh, ended up with this lockdown project. So I, I took the Kieran's Git project and basically just started adding annotations as I worked through it. Um, over the course of about three months, the, the main source code grew from 101K to 1.7 megabytes. That's a lot of comments going in there quite, you know, I mean, I know assembly language is pretty terse, but <laughs> the comments were waffly. And the, the, the bits that I uh, started to analyze, I made notes and they've kind of developed over time into there's about 50 deep dive articles on various aspects of Elite. And these are all currently, um, you can see them on a website, bbcelite.com is where, where it all lives. Um, and that, that website is generated from the, the Git source, um, which is linked to from there. So you can build this version of Elite. It, it matches exactly the released version and you can go in and play with it and uh, read about it on the website. So um, that's where you can head for if you're more interested in this project. So I thought what I'd do um, is have a look at what I discovered during those three months and just run through some of the more interesting aspects of how Elite works because I had absolutely no idea how any of this worked when I started. And um, it was a really interesting voyage of discovery. Some of this stuff will have been covered on the web. There are, there are great articles about, you know, the procedural generation of Elite and stuff like that, but there is some stuff that I hadn't really found out there. So this is a whistle-stop tour through some of the more um, interesting aspects that I found. And to be honest, there's plenty more that could be said about this game. It really is a, you know, it's an epic piece of coding. Um, Right, so let's start with some general statistics about the, the Elite source code. Now, this is the cassette version of Elite, because that's the version that Kieran put on his uh, in his GitHub uh, project. I'm working currently on the 6502 second processor one and integrating that into this system. But if we look at the cassette version, it's uh, just under 9,500 instructions across 401 routines, split across multiple programs but there's essentially the loader program and the main game code and you can see that 10 percent of those are all about drawing ships which is obviously a vital part of any space game um, there's an awful lot of maths in there really full-on multiplication and division stuff which is well it made my mind melt anyway um, there's seven percent of it is all about emulating the universe and so on so you can see that it breaks down um uh, in, into, into quite a few different areas. Um, but obviously the, the emphasis is on drawing, drawing ships, you've got drawing lines there, you've got drawing planets and the circles. So um, uh, it's interesting to see how they split. And you can see, if you look at the source code, you can often see how these split up between stuff that was written on an atom and stuff that was written on a BBC micro, because the stuff that was written on an atom, which includes the, the ship drawing code, um, uses labels with two letters and then numbers, so XX16, that's a typical atom style assembly label. Um, so that's the breakdown of the code. Um, memory usage is one of the first things I looked at was how much memory does Elite use? Now it's, it's famous for using every single byte possible. Um, it doesn't use every single byte, but it comes pretty close. Let's start with, a, we've got 64K of addressable memory from the 6502. Um, obviously not all of that's available to us because uh, a massive chunk of it is used by the, the operating system here and this is what's used in Elite so it's the very basic stuff you've got obviously the ROM and the basic or whatever is in the, in the page ROM at the time and uh, then a couple of pages of workspace some of the tape filing system in, in page three and then some stuff in zero page so those we can't use in Elite obviously they're taken by the machine operating system um, We've then got some shared stuff, which includes the split screen mode, the screen mode, which is not quite 8K, but pretty close. Um, and then there's the 6502 stack. Elite does use the other end of that page for one of its own heaps, and they grow together and hopefully don't clash. So that's kind of shared, so there's 8K there. And then you have the actual code, and this is the code, breaks down into the game code, ship blueprints, which are all the different ship designs, and various workspaces, um, where they've pretty much used uh, almost every byte. But you can see on the right-hand column there, there's an unused column. Um, those are unused locations um, that, uh, so it's not quite the whole memory. There's 66, actually this 67, I think I found another one the other day um, that aren't used. So uh, presumably, <laughs> if you wanted to extend Elite, you could use those to, to do so. But it is uh, a pretty impressive 
spread of code that uses pretty much every corner of the BBC Micro. So the one of the first things I wanted to get my head around was the split screen mode. This is a very celebrated aspect of Elite. Um, and it was the thing I really wanted. I figured if I could get my head around how this worked, I could probably get my head around how the rest of it worked. Wasn't bright about that, incidentally, but um, that was what I, I thought at the time. So I'm sure this has been covered before, um, but essentially the, the split screen mode is based on, on two aspects. One is reprogramming the, the 6845 into a, a nice handy square mode. So, you know, you'll notice that Elite is not as wide as normal screen modes. Um, and that's because um, they've defined it so that it's 256 pixels across, 256 bits um, and for a monochrome pixel. So it makes the calculations of how to draw on screen really easy. You can easily convert from a character column, uh, a character um, row rather, into a page. Each character row is one page, fits nicely. So that's one of the reasons that's done. It's actually 31 rows, not 32. Um, it's based on mode four, basically, but it's 31 rows of mode four squished in a bit. And that's because the last row is actually used to store the Python ship blueprint. So you can't see that, it's off screen. Um, so that's the first aspect of, of the screen mode. Um, but obviously the celebrated part is that it has black and white at the top and color at the bottom. Um, 192 rows of mode four at the top and 56 rows of mode five at the bottom. And the way that it, it does this is using the main interrupt handler um, to run a routine that does this. Basically, each time it starts at vertical sync, so which is on character row 34, that's where it's standard. So when the, when the raster reaches that point, it sets a timer um, using the, the VIA T1 timer. Uh, to 14,622, which is a fairly strange figure, but it, it is kind of calculated depending on what it needs to do. This starts ticking down and it, um, it switches things to mode um, four at this point and sets the palette to monochrome. Starts ticking down and meet all the time the, the, the screen is being drawn and when it reaches zero, that is at the top of the dashboard and it reprograms the video ULA to change the mode five and then repeats the whole thing. So this runs 50 times a second and does that flip. Um, and this is how they do the um, hyperspace effect um, in that they don't bother to change the top bit into mode four and leave it as mode five. So it goes kind of crazy mottled co color effect when you actually do a hyperspace. And it also supports the, the uh, different color for the dashboard for a skate pod because it just codes in a different palette every time it goes around. So that's essentially how the split screen mode works. It's, it's a really clever piece of, um, of code and uh, very effective. And that was one of the things, first things that I wanted to get my head around. Um, the next thing which is really celebrated is how the uh, galaxy is generated, the, the 256 systems in each galaxy and eight galaxies. And this entire thing is generated from three 16-bit seed numbers. That's it. The whole thing starts with those. You can see them at the top there. Those they're W0, W1, and W2. Those are set for system zero, or system one, let's call it, in galaxy one. It's actually zeros, but it gets displayed on screen as one. And, and the process is, um, there's a process called twisting that gets applied to these three numbers to generate the next um, number in the sequence. And it, this, this, this uses something called the Tribonacci series, which is like the Fibonacci series, but adds up the previous three numbers. So you can see it at the bottom there. So to get the next, the next set of seeds in this sequence, you just add the previous three together, and shift them down by one. So it's a very simple piece of maths. And the way that the, each galaxy is generated is you take system one, and then you, you twist it four times to get system two, you twist it four times to get system three and so on. Um, so you can get the entire galaxy from those that one set of seeds. And the reason it's four is that each, each of those four um, generates uh, two letters of the name. So you can have the letters of each system is up to eight, eight uh, characters. Let's have a look a bit more about the, the information you can get from these seeds. So each, each system in a galaxy has 
specific set of seeds. And from that, uh, the code calculates all of these different aspects. This is page one of two. So from that, you can get the species adjectives, which are all about slimy, you know, bug-eyed, whatever they are, toads and rodents and things like that. Um, average radius of the system, the government type, uh, prosperity levels, so all the stuff you see in the data on system page is generated from these, from, from the seed tech level. And then we've also got the galactic X coordinate. So if you look where it is in the galaxy, whether it's shown as a, a large or small dot in the galaxy map, and whether it's shown as a, a large or small or medium circle in the short range system map, You've got um, a bit that uh, generates the, the uh, decides on the length of the name, so that they're not all eight characters. Um, and then you get the you get the uh, the name token, which is a two letter token from uh, one of these bytes on each of them. So for each of those four, it generates two letters, but one of those tokens only has one letter. So you can get um, odd numbers systems as well. And then finally, the last three there are when you actually arrive in the system, then the distance you are from the planet the distance you are from the sun and the offset from where you've arrived of the sun are determined by these. So that they actually determine how you arrive in the system as well. Um, all from just three numbers and one really short routine that's very quick to generate. So it's, it's amazing that the, 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 the galaxy in Elite is, comes from such a small bit of code. Um, the next thing that's interesting is printing text in Elite. It doesn't just sit there, the text, in a kind of easily viewed manner. It's stored in a way that makes it very compact, but also extremely hard to understand. Um, so it's tokenized, basically, and it's tokenized using three different types of token. There are um, 13 different control codes in there. For example, control code three is the current system name. Con Control code four is the commander's name uh, and so on. Then you have the two letter tokens that, that I alluded to before, which um, are used in, in generating the system name um, as well as printing text. And then you have a recursive token system, which in which tokens can refer to other tokens that can refer to other tokens and so on. So if we take an example here, uh, recursive token 131 is actually defined as being a space and then two letter token 159, and then a space. Two letter token 159 is on. So 131 is on with a space around it. If you then move on to recursive token three, that's a D, then um, two letter token 145, which is A, T, then an A, then 131, which is our space on space, and then control code three, which is current system name. So that, that one three, recursive token three expands to data on and then the current system name. So that's used to show, um, that's the title of the, the data on page within Elite. And so that it can say print this just by saying print token three. So it's a very compact uh, way of, of squishing the text in. Um, in fact, it sits in three pages of memory and has one spare byte. So it's, it's really squashed in there, the, um, the text, there's not a lot of room. Well, there's no room really. <laughs> so that's the, the text. The next thing that's interesting is how does Elite simulate its, um, the, the space that we are in? So when you're flying through space, you're at the center of it in your Cobra Mark III, and there's this local bubble of universe around you. And that's where all the ships live. It's where the planet and the sun, and the space stations, everything you see is in this bubble. Um, now each each ship, I, I call I'll call them ships because there can be planets and suns and cargo canisters and all sorts. But let's just call them all ships because they all use the same data structures. There's up to thirteen of them, thirteen ship slots. The first one is always the planet, and the second one is always either the sun or the space station. But you can't have both. You'll notice if you're flying along and you go into the space station safe zone and you're looking at the sun, it will suddenly disappear when you enter the space station zone. That's because they share the same slot. So you only get one of those. Um, but then the other 11 can be anything. Anything from Thargoids to cargo canisters to asteroids. Now, each of these ships has its own ship data block, which contains things like, where is it in space? It's a 3D coordinate. Um, uh, orientation vectors, which we'll come into in, in a bit. Roll and pitch counters, which determine how that ship is rolling and pitching. It's got things like speed, acceleration, energy levels, and various flags 
uh, that determine whether it's hostile, whether it has artificial intelligence enabled for tactics, um, whether it's currently exploding, whether it's been killed, that sort of thing. And on top of this, so this is stored in memory in, uh, uh, it's actually at um, uh, page nine, uh, and uh, I'll go into a little bit about how that's done in a second, but they're stored in memory. The, these are about the individual instances of ships, but each ship type also has a blueprint, which if you like, contains the, the spec of that ship. So that's things like the shape of its wireframe, um, the bounty you get when you kill it, the size of the targetable area that you have to try and hit with your lasers, its maximum speed, that sort of stuff, even down to the shape of the explosion when it blows up, how many points go turn into, uh, into clouds. And finally, each ship also has its own ship line heap. Um, we'll talk a bit about ship line heaps and heaps in a second, but essentially that's a buffer for when you, when you draw it on screen, um, you store the information in the ship line heap so you can easily redraw it and remove it from the screen. So this is all stored in, in page nine upwards. Um, and um, but each ship block gets moved into zero page for processing because it's much quicker and more efficient to process stuff in zero page in, in assembly. So um, there's a lot of moving of data around when when things are moved. I'll briefly mention the orientation vectors. Now these are um, essentially it's a left-handed uh, coordinate system. So if you put out your left hand and point it like this. Uh, I mean, I came up with these names and they, they seem to work. <laughs> so there's three of them, three vectors. You've got nose, the nose vector, which points out of the ship's nose. You've got the roof vector, which points out of the ship's roof. And then you've got the side vector, which points out of the ship's right-hand side. And these three vectors determine that ship's orientation in space. So you can see that to pitch it, you'd roll it around the side vector and to actually you can't yaw in this game, but that would be how it is. <laughs> and rotation is, is around um, the nose, that would be rolling. Um, and so when you when Elite implements these, these pitching and rolling of other ships, it's changing the orient, rotating the orientation vectors. Now that's fine, but Elite uses um, a thing called the small angle approximation to rotate all of its vectors, which means it's quick and easy to do, but it's slightly inaccurate. So over time, these vectors get stretched and get a bit wonky. And if you didn't do anything about that, your ships would slowly start to kind of morph. And, and if you turn off that part of the code, you can kind of see it happening slowly that they get a bit warped. So every now and then, regularly, these vectors get tidied. Um, and what that does is it makes them orthonormal, which is make sure that they're at, uh, 90 degrees to each other, which is normal and orthogonal, which means that they um, have length one, so that they don't get stretched and it doesn't get warped. And so that's done regularly throughout the code. Um, another th interesting thing to point here is uh, the Thargoid mothership has an, is slightly different in that the, the side V, side vector is the one that points out to the roof and the others point out to the sides. So if, if I'm holding my, this is my Thargoid, it's actually up and down like this and its roof is this way. And the reason for that is that when it pitches, it does this, it actually rotates like a traditional flying saucer does. So you'll notice if you're fighting Thargoids in Elite and you often kind of want to get them in your sights and they pitch up and you pitch back, they do it kind of on their side and rotate in a kind of weird, you know, like uh, side on flying saucer view. And that's because um, their vectors are slightly rotated to, to intentionally create this effect. Right, next thing that's interesting about Elite is that we are literally at the center of the universe. And we, when we move, when we rotate, we don't move, everything else does. So every time you move, you're going forward, backwards, rolling, pitching, we don't actually move in terms of the internal representation of the universe. Everything else shifts around us. Um, as I mentioned before, this uses the small angle approximation, which um, in which sine A is A and cos A is one. It's not a lot of tan going on in this game, but that makes life a lot easier. So you can see at the bottom there, those are the um, uh, equations that get applied when we do a roll and a pitch by 
angle alpha and, and pitch uh, angle beta. Uh, that's it's still reasonably complicated that, but that is an awful lot simpler than the actual equation, which I didn't have room for on the slide, uh, and which contains an awful lot of trigonometry. But this this trigonometry is only kind of um, o, o level standard stuff. It's not really that difficult once you've got your head around it. Um, there is one thing that's a bit of a mind bender, and that's the Minsky surfer algorithm that is applied here, which essentially reuses one of these values um, in, in a way that I won't bother trying to explain now, but it does make things slightly more accurate um, when rotating. Uh, so that's how things get rotated. And because of that approximation, that's why all the vectors have to be tidied up regularly. So that's the universe. I mentioned briefly about line heaps. Now, when things get drawn, particularly ships, suns and planets, it's quite expensive. There's a lot of calculation going on. There's an awful lot of detail in these things. So Elite stores all of these shapes in buffers, which are called the line heaps. Um, and this is so that the, once you've drawn the ship, you can easily redraw it because everything's drawn using um, Eeyore logic and it will disappear from the screen. Um, and so you'll notice that, that you know, when things cross, they, they kind of cancel each other out and that's why. So every object on the screen has its own line heap. Um, the ship line heap just stores each of the lines it draws as part of a ship as a coordinate pair. So that's fairly easy to understand. The sun line heap, which in the big ball of the sun is actually stored as 192 half widths. <laughs> there are 192 lines on the screen in the space view. And so for each of those lines, it stores um, whether it's zero if there's no sun line on that. If there is a sun line on that, it stores the center lines x coordinate in one place. And then the half width is the distance from that center line to the edge of the sun. And, and it's obviously the same on either side because it's, um, uh, it's a circle. Um, and so uh, uh, it stores that, what, that half width for each line. So there's 193 bytes required to store the sun. Um, and it's easy to then redraw that just by looking at each value and just redrawing that line. And finally, the ball line heap stores all the circles, and it does that by storing the coordinates of the points around the circle's perimeter, um, which it splits up into 64 segments. Let's have a quick look at how the main program flow goes. Um, so um, what is it doing? It's looping around, doing all these things. So it, first of all, it calculates the pitch and roll angles from how we're moving our ship. It checks all the flight keys. Um, using a, a keyboard um, logger uh, so that it can you can press them all at the same time. There's about seven of them that you can press concurrently. It then goes through every single ship in the local bubble. And for each one, it moves that ship by either by, by, by our pitch and roll. And if we're moving our speed as well, um, but in the opposite direction. So if you imagine we're going this way, that would, it would move it back by that amount. Um, uh, it uh, processes things like energy bombs, collisions, docking, scooping, that sort of stuff. Um, it implements the side views simply by flipping the axes within the program. It doesn't really have any different logic. It just goes, am I looking out of the side view? If I am, rotate all of the axes of everything I've got in memory so that it fits the side view. And then it just goes off and does what it, was, what it does with the front view. So those are all implemented just as a kind of twisting of the the way it looks at things. So it's, a, it's a quite a simple uh, approach to what could have been a complex problem. Um, and then finally, it draws the ship um, and removes any killed ships. When, it, when a ship is killed, its memory gets shuffled down so that there's always as big of a, a gap of free memory. So its ship rock gets moved, its ship heap gets moved and, and, and squished down. Um, and then we also get altitude checks with the sun and the planet. Um, processing laser fire, uh, ECM, fuel scooping. The, the stardust gets updated, all the little little bits of stardust that shoot past you as you, as, as you fly. Um, it does some checking to uh, random number checking to uh, spawn ships, pirates um, or traders, uh, setting all of that, or even Thargoids, setting all of those flags according to whether they're hostile or not and stuff like that. Lasers cool down, the dashboard gets updated at the bottom, and then finally it checks for all the non-flight keys like, you know, system on data and stuff like that. And it just goes round and round and round on this loop um, until you die or quit. And it, and it worked. One of the key things about this is, is there is a main loop counter in which it decides what to do when 
based on a value, MCNT, main loop counter, that basically every time it goes around the loop decrements by one. And it's used to decide what to do, when to do the more time consuming aspects of the game. So it only decides to spawn another ship every 256 loops. Um, it only checks to see if we're near a space station every 32 iterations and same with altitude um, and uh, low energy, does those once every 32. Every 16 iterations, it might flash the dial if you've uh, configured that and it tidies one ship's orientation vectors because that's quite a uh, complex business. Every eight iterations, it applies tactics to either one or two ships. Um, so uh, uh, and that's the, you know, how they move and how they attack and run away and all that sort of stuff. And it regenerates your energy and shield. And then every four iterations, um, it updates the non-essential dials on the dashboard. Uh, which is everything except for the compass and the um, 3D scanner and the speed and pitch and roll. Everything else is, is less important. And then pretty much everything else happens on every um, uh, iteration around the main loop. Another thing that Leet has is extended screen coordinates. It, it does all of its calculations in 16 bits. And of course, 16 bits doesn't fit onto a nice 256 by 192 screen. So if you, you can imagine that the, the BBC micro screen is one, one TV in a massive bank of 256 by 256 screens. And Elite does its calculations, ignoring all these screens, it just does them across the whole lot. And then when it comes to display what's on screen, it just displays what's in the middle. And it does that really easily by um, only displaying, it knows it's on screen if the high byte is zero, and if the uh, low byte, uh, the Y coordinate is less than 192. So it's, it, 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 and this enables it very quickly to have, to have ships that are sticking off screen and it just does all the calculations and only when it comes to draw does it actually clip it to the screen and it's a very quick uh, calculation. Drawing pixels, yeah, so we've talked about it using EOR logic and that means that if you draw something on screen and then you draw it again, it, it, the second time it raises it. Um, there's two routines for drawing. I mean, I won't talk about poking into memory. That's uh, quite a well-known thing. It just pokes directly into memory. Um, I mentioned that the 256 pixel width makes life a lot easier with the calculations. Um, but basically, it's just literally poking it into, into screen. And because it's monochrome in the space view, it's relatively simple to do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm looking at the 6502 second processor one. It's a bit hairier because it's in color. But the principles are the same. So there are various pixel routines, and you've got two main line routines. You've got H loin for horizontal lines, and then you've got loin, as it's called, um, which uh, uses Bresenham's algorithm to draw um, uh, all the other diagonal and, and vertical lines. Um, the sun, as I said, is drawn out of horizontal lines with the center point and then half widths. That's how that's done. Circles are straight line segments with up to 64 points per circle. But the same routine is used for not only for planets, but for the launch tunnel and hyperspace as well, just with bigger step sizes. So it's all the same routine. You just pass in one different value um, to get a, a polygonal uh, tunnel. And the circles they use um, lookup tables for the trigonometry rather than the small angle approximation. So it's a completely separate piece of, um, piece of work there. Um, possibly could have been written by a different person as there were two of them, hard to say really. Um, the ship drawing aspect is, is quite celebrated. Um, ship wireframes are stored in uh, the game using uh, as vertices, edges and faces. The vertices are the points of the wire mesh uh, the edges are the lines between two points and the faces are obviously the, the polygons. Um, each of these has a, a visibility distance associated with it beyond which they just get ignored and don't get drawn. So that is one of the first ways of making this efficient is to go through each of them and just discard any that are too far away. Um, and then what it does is it works out which faces are visible using back face culling, which basically looks at whether a face is pointing towards us or away from us. Um, faces are stored as a, a, a normal vector that comes out of the face. So the calculation uses the dot product of the vectors um, with your line of sight to work out which way it's pointing, which is a relatively quick um, process. It then projects these 
uh, having worked out which faces are visible, um, works out which vertices are associated with each of these faces, and projects them onto the screen um, to get those large uh, extended screen coordinates I mentioned before. And then the final thing is an edge is visible if at least one of the associated faces is visible. So it just goes through all the edges, checks the faces, and if it's visible, it takes the endpoints, which we've just projected, and sticks them in the ship line heap. Um, and it also adds a laser line if the ship is firing at us. And then finally, it just goes through the ship line heap and draws the, draws the ship, um, which is a whistle-stop tour through a very complex bit of code um, that took a while to decode. Um, another thing that's interesting is how does it check for successful docking? Which obviously is a very important part of Elite. Um, and I wanted to know what <laughs> what it was because it's spent a long time learning to dock as you as you would do when you play this game. So basically, to dock successfully, the game asks a bunch of questions. So the first one is, are we close enough to the station? Obviously, that's important. You've got to be pretty close to be heading through the uh, <coughs> the, the, the docking door. Second one it asks, is the station friendly? If it's not friendly, you die. You can't dock with a, an unfriendly station. Um, the third one is, is orientation. Are we pointing within 26 degrees of the nominal approach vector? The norm nominal approach vector is a line sticking straight out of the slot of the space station. So we've got to be pointing at an angle that's less than 26 degrees off that um, line's angle. So you can't kind of can't be can't go in sideways. You've got to be pointing vaguely in the right direction. The next one is location. Are we in uh, a, a cone of safe approach, if you like, which is a 22 degree cone. Um, so we have to be in the right place, not only pointing in the right direction, but in the right place as well. And then the final one is checking whether the slot is horizontal or pretty close. So you've got a 33 degree um, leeway there. Um, if all of these are met, um, then we dock. Otherwise, we start to take damage and eventually die if you don't sort it out. So there you go, that's the, the maths behind docking. Another one uh, is to is how do we know, or how does the game know when you're hitting an enemy with your lasers? So um, if we're firing at an enemy, or if our laser is firing really, doesn't it, it, it tries to work out for each ship in the bubble as it's working through the main loop, it goes, right, is it, am I being hit? So first of all, make sure the ship is in front of us, um, which makes sense. I remember we've rotated stuff if we're looking out of the rear and the side, so it's still in front of us as far as the game is concerned, if we're using a side or a rear laser. Um, make sure it isn't the planet or the sun, because we can't destroy those. Obviously, the ship can't already be exploding, and it's got to be close enough to be uh, hittable. And then the final thing is whether um, our crosshairs are within the targetable area for this ship. And that is basically just the distance between our lasers and how far off is it on the screen in terms of x and y and it does a uh, pythagoras and works at x squared plus y squared doesn't bother with the square root and compares that with the value in that ship's blueprint which is bigger for bigger ships so essentially bigger ships can be further off our optimal uh, line and if they uh, if, if they're in line we hit them so that's how that works um, Another thing that's interesting about Elite is the uh, competition code. You'll remember that it came with a uh, postcard where you could um, send in uh, your uh, uh, how you've done. Whenever you save in Elite, it puts up this long 10-digit uh, gobbledygook number. You can copy it onto your postcard. You put your cash levels on, send it off to Acorn Soft. I mean, I think it's probably closed now, but um, this was back in 1984. Um, and that competition code enabled Acornsoft to see whether you'd been cheating. Um, really clever, there's a little basic program on the source disks that, that takes that code and, and checks it. Um, and obviously it's generated within the source code. And the things that are, gener are included in this 10 digit code are the competition flags, um, which uh, contain information such as whether or not you've used manual miss jumps, which you can do by pausing the game, pressing X, unpausing the game, and then when you do a hyperspace, if you hold down control, you'll go into which space and be surrounded by Thargoids that you can pick off uh, and, and pick up the Thargons. So that's a kind of a 
cheat, I guess, or it might, might enable you to get to elite more quickly. Anyway, that information is stored in your competition code um, and uh, in your save file as well, by the way. So, you know, it's obviously once you've done it once, it's there forever. Um, it also has a list, it keeps details of all the different platforms that this commander file has been uh, loaded or saved from. Um, and post, uh, after some of the biggest bug fixes, there was a, a, a bug in the BBC disk version. I forget what it did now, but it did enable you to um, uh, sidestep some of the efforts. Um, and so when, when they fixed that bug, they changed the, uh, the flags so that they would know whether uh, um, the commander file was from before that bug or after it. And it also has a bunch of checksums in there that can tell whether that someone's been tampering with the file or not. Um, so all of those are in the competition flags. Uh, in that 10 digit competition code, there's also uh, one byte from the cache amount. It's a four byte number. One of those bytes is encoded in there. And so is the high byte of your two byte kill tally, which is where you get your combat rank from. And the high byte is, is non-zero if you're competent up to elite. So it, it can tell what your rank is if you're competent or above. And so they would get this postcard at Aconsoft HQ and somebody would presumably type that number in to this program along with the amount of cash that you'd written on the um, postcard and it could tell you all this information, whether it tallied with the cash figure, whether you'd cheated or not. Um, and uh, yeah, so that would enable them to check whether you deserved a badge. Um, those, that's pretty much uh, everything I've written about on this. Um, there's loads more on bbcleak.com, things like the 3D scanner, explosion clouds, the key logger I briefly talked about, market prices, all the maths and stardust routines, how the tactics work, um, things like printing numbers. And also, if you want to build Elite from the source, then uh, there's a link to the GitHub repository that, um, that will enable you to do that. Um, and future plans for this project, I'm working on integrating the 6502 second processor version into this so that, well, currently the plan is that one source can build both and you literally be able to compare and see what, what, what's different between the cassette version and the, the 6502 second processor version. And one day, hopefully, um, we'll be able to do the same with the disk version, maybe the electron version. Who knows? Uh, there are other 6502 versions out there um, that could also feed into this. So um, not over yet. And that's it. Thank you, Mark. That was brilliant. Um, and a really, really deep dive into into the code. Um, I look forward to seeing how they jiggled with the 6502 processor version. So the we've, we've got time for questions. The way the ships are drawn, it would be really nice if you could erase a line from the old ship and draw a line of the new ship to reduce the flicker. Is that feasible, do you think, with the current code base? Um, yeah, I've read about that. So apparently the master version does that, I've heard. Um, I've heard mentioned that it does anyway. Um, yeah, it, I mean, essentially, when, you, when it goes into the draw routine, one, one of the first things it does is redraw the ship in its current position, which removes it from the screen, and then it redraws the whole new ship. But given that the ship line buffer is made up of pairs of um, lines, it wouldn't be rocket science to, instead of doing that each time you calculate an edge and put it into the ship line heap you pull out the one that's in there and draw that one first and then draw the new one it, it probably wouldn't instead of pulling all of the all the lines out of the ship line heap and drawing them and putting the whole lot back in you just interlace that mm. would probably do what what you're talking about um i mean I, I'd, I'd like to have a look at the master version and see exactly how it's done because that would be, a, I think that would be a relatively small tweak. Certainly wouldn't require re-engineering the system because the mass of that routine is calculating the, the coordinates to draw, not the actual drawing of them. And the actual drawing of them is just handed off to the, the, the uh, line drawing routine, you know, in a loop, just sends them out. So that's quite simple. So I think that could, that could be done relatively easily. Um, the challenge with changing this um, version of Elite is that if you do change too much, as it currently stands, it does tend to break it. I think there's quite a lot of stuff sitting near page boundaries that goes wonky if you don't then match them up. So it's, it's certainly possible to make relatively minor changes, but you run out of space really quickly. Um, you know, there's 
those 66 free bytes aren't in the right place. They're not like at the end. <laughs> you can't just add some code in and push it up to there. So um, the challenge would be doing it in, um, in the code. However, the 65022 second processor version is a lot more forgiving because it, it's just a bit like it's spread out. So it's, that would be a lot easier. And that does use the same um, line ship drawing uh, routine as uh, so the cassette version. There's, there's almost no differences. Most of them are down to um, the fact that it's drawing ships in color um, and with different colors for different ships. So the, the actual ship line, ship drawing routine is the same. So it, it would be a lot easier to add that code to the second processor version. And then you could probably backport it if it was small enough, because I don't think, I think you could do it efficiently. And you might even find there are, there are a couple of blocks of memory that have, you know, I think there's one unused duplicated multiplication routine that you could reuse and just jump into that, let it do the stuff and jump back out again if you needed more space. So it's definitely feasible um, and uh, wouldn't wouldn't be that difficult, I don't think. But I've read about that and I thought that's one to try because, yeah, it's, I've heard that the master version is a lot smoother. I haven't, haven't actually delved into it yet, though. Yeah, I hadn't realised that the master already did that. I, I, yeah, I think... I've seen that on on Stardot forums that I think uh, Rich Talbot Watkins was saying that he thinks that's how that one works. Okay. So anyway, there's a, there's something to check. Okay, so I guess the the other thing then for the master version would be, can you use Shadow RAM as well, or instead of that trick to get rid of the flicker completely? Yes. And that's completely beyond my knowledge. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Model B person. <laughs> I, have, I have typed on a master and that's about as detailed as it got. But yes, um, surely that could, could, could be done as well, yes. Yeah, I guess it's currently using that memory to run in mode one and, and two, I guess. Yeah. yeah, I suspect. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Great talk. Any more questions? I'd like to say thanks to Mark. <clears throat> it's, uh, I've been following it with great interest. And I'm really looking forward to if you can get uh, the disk version and the second processor version. So that would be really interesting. Yeah, the second processor version is no problem because the source is also on Ian Bell's site for that. So that one's in progress. The disk version, I haven't actually tracked down a source yet. So I'd be working from a disassembly, which is different skill set. <laughs> But um, certainly possible, you know, they are, I mean, I think that the disc version and the cassette version are probably pretty similar apart from the extra features because, you know, they are the same game. So it's probably more about um, structure of code into the two different programs rather than cramming it into one. Um, and certainly the functionality of the disc version is all in the 6502 second processor version. So, um, you know, having, when I've got around to getting that one building and, and documented, the information should be there. And it should be then hopefully an easier job to, to do the disk version. Ditto with the electron version, which, you know, is cut down again. Are you going to try and make it a single source for all of them, or is that...? I am for the 6502 and the, and the cassette one, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm working on now is basically adding, you know, if if, if statements into the um, BBASM source code where right. that makes sense. Because obviously yeah. with the 6502 uh, second processor version, the drawing code is all in the... The, the, the BBC part rather than the second processor and it's in colour and the colour bit actually is the bit that makes a, a biggest difference really um, so there's some stuff that is just obviously different in these versions but the, the actual code of the whole universe and everything the only real differences I've been bumping into have been uh, changes to, to make the use of the 65CO2 opcodes that the, the second processor can run so you know there's just instead of it instead of it being you know uh, load load A with zero and stick it in a, a memory location. You can use SDZ, so it's that kind of thing. So it's it's quite fiddly getting getting all of it building from one source, but it's, it's certainly not difficult. So I would hope to have that. Certainly, I'd hope to have that working quite soon without any commentary. The commentary is the bit that takes the time. Yeah, um, that can so get it building first, and then then I can and know which bits uh, I need to you know, add commentary too. So that's, it's ongoing. That's, you know, we have another lockdown going on. So <laughs> why not? Got to have something to do. Yeah, and if, uh, when I'm playing with it, because I occasionally fiddle about with it, if I, um, do, do you welcome feedback on things like, um, you were saying about 
if things get pushed over page boundaries, it breaks and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I think I can't remember what I did. I think I put some like asserts in there to say, whoop, that's moved. Um, yes, um, that would that would be. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there are, it, the issues thing is open on the Git repository. So yeah, is uh, it just stick them in there? Yeah, stick them in there. I think that's probably the best thing. I'm gonna have to say my Git skills aren't perfect, so <laughs> whatever. It's, it's probably the hardest part. Is, <laughs> but yeah, get the information. I'm, I'm very happy to roll stuff in if it improves things. Yeah, I mean, the idea oh. is that the, the the Git repository produces the binary from the released version. That's the idea. How it does that, um, you know, the the idea is kind of to to. It's all about celebrating the original source. This project and and seeing exactly how they wrote this. And so anything that can that fits in with that process and makes things easier. Yeah, that would be great. No, yeah, your insights are really, really great on the code. I mean, you say it's quite verbose. I think verbose is good for this sort of stuff. Some of it's really, yeah, it's, it's quite way out there, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. I love the fact that you can have one instruction that has such serious ramifications <laughs> that it needs an essay. <laughs> it's brilliant. Thank you very, very much. much. <laughs> uh, that was that was brilliant very enjoyable